Love it or hate it, the choke tackle has made its way into the toolbox of many rugby teams. Whether you're playing in the Rugby World Cup or for your local club, it's probably being utilised in some way or another. In this video, we're going to be taking a detailed look at the choke tackle from a few different angles. First, we'll take a look at how the choke tackle works, breaking down the laws that make it possible. Then we'll move on to interpretation how choke tackles may look different from game to game. Next is popularity, looking at the timeline of how the choke tackle came to prominence. And we'll finish things off with an interesting tidbit about the choke tackle that's often overlooked. For the casual rugby viewer, the choke tackle has to be one of the strangest and least intuitive things you can watch in a rugby match. Even the term choke tackle confuses things a bit. It sounds more like something you would watch The Undertaker perform on WWE. The choke tackle is essentially the defending team holding up the ball carrier in open play to create a wall, with the goal being that the wall ends unsuccessfully, therefore winning a turnover in the form of a scrum. So let's break this down in terms of the laws of the game. A maul is formed in the field of play and consists of the ball carrier and at least one player from each team, bound together and on their feet. Once the maul is formed, it's time to move on to the next part of the operation, ensuring that the maul ends unsuccessfully, but legally. If we take another look at the laws, a maul ends unsuccessfully when the ball becomes unplayable, or the maul collapses, but not as a result of foul play. Or, the maul does not move towards the goal line for longer than 5 seconds. And finally, if the ball carrier comes to ground and the ball is not immediately available. In this example, Padovini carries the ball into contact and Henshaw wraps him up ball and all, cleverly blocking the offload to Bellini. Ross Byrne senses an opportunity and joins Henshaw in holding Padovini up. Jaden Hayward spots the danger at this point and tries to help his teammates get to ground, but unfortunately for him, it's too late, and as soon as Hayward joins, we have the ball carrier, Padovini, and at least one player from each team, two Irish players and one Italian player, bound together and on their feet. Therefore, a mall is created. Now it's just a matter of time until the mall ends unsuccessfully. In this case, due to the mall collapsing, not as a result of foul play, and Ireland are awarded the scrum. As with most aspects of rugby, the finer details of the choke tackle can vary from game to game. As we saw previously, the law states that a maul is formed when a player from each team is bound to the ball carrier and on their feet. The reality is that the timing of when the maul is formed will depend on the referee's interpretation. Generally speaking, referees who like more positive, free-flowing play will tend to hold off on calling a maul immediately in the hopes that the ball carrier's knees will touch the ground and a tackle will be formed meaning that the defending team must release the ball carrier, whereas stricter referees, who keep their interpretations closer to the letter of the law, are likely to call a maul more quickly as soon as a player from each team is bound to the ball carrier. Here's an example from referee Jerome Garces. Henry Slade carries the ball into contact and is held up by two Irish players. Mako Vinopola is bound here, and another referee may have called a maul at this point, but Garces stays quiet, in the hopes that the ball will emerge and play will continue. When Slade comes to ground, Garces clearly communicates to the Irish players to leave the ball, and fearful of giving away a penalty for not rolling away, that's exactly what they do. 
Now for a completely different example. Sam Whitelock and Kieran Reid hold up CJ Stander. Tyg Furlong joins, forming a moor. From the time that Tyg Furlong binds onto CJ Stander and the mall collapses, only three seconds have passed, yet referee Nigel Owens calls them all formed and awards the scrum to New Zealand. Another referee, or maybe even just another time in the same game, the referee may have called for defenders to roll away. I think the key takeaway here is to play to the referee and adapt. It's not uncommon for teams to realise they're not getting much out of the referee and to adjust their tactics accordingly. Whilst the laws themselves that make the choke tackle possible have been around for a long time, it was only really utilised as a straight up tactic during the 2010s. The choke tackle was popularised by Ireland's defence coach Les Kiss during the 2011 World Cup. It particularly stood out in Ireland's pool game against Australia. The choke tackle driving Ireland to victory in a big game where Australia were favourites. Coaches around the world took note. Whilst not all teams incorporated the choke tackle into their game immediately, adoption seemed to slowly spread throughout the coming years, and it seemed inevitable that just about every team would pick it up as a tactic. It got to the point around 2014 to 2015 where the choke tackle was ubiquitous in rugby. Everyone was using it. It was choke tackle after choke tackle after choke tackle. This caused frustration amongst coaches but more importantly, the fans. After all, who would want to watch 80 minutes full of collapsed malls turning into scrums which themselves, let's be honest, were likely to collapse? It slowed the game down to a snail's pace and was not a great advert for rugby. So, what happened? Did World Rugby put their foot down and change the laws? Did the negative reputation of the choke tackle get to teams? Well, as is often the case in rugby, teams adapted, which has changed the choke tackle from a primary tactic to an opportunistic one. One point quite often overlooked by fans, commentators and even referees sometimes is how the outcome of a maul will change when it's formed directly after a kick. Let's take a look at item number 18 under mauls in the law book. If a maul is formed immediately after a player has directly caught an opponent's kick in open play, a scrum that is awarded for any of the above reasons, those being the reasons for an unsuccessful scrum that we looked at previously, will be to the team of the ball catcher. Yes, that means if the choke tackle is set up, holding up an opposition player who has just caught a kick from your team, the ensuing scrum is awarded to the team in possession. There is no turnover. Here's an example from the infamous Island game versus Australia. Sexton puts up a kick, and Genia catches it. Now there's no tackle, no pass. In fact, Genia barely gets a chance to see who is in front of him before he gets wrapped up by Rob Carney and Jamie Heaslip. Island successfully set up the ball, and the ball doesn't emerge. Only this time, Bryce Lawrence awards the scrum to Australia as it is straight from the kick. Thank you for watching this video. It's the first time that I've done something like this, so I'd love to hear your feedback. If you enjoyed it and want to see more content like this, make sure you like the video and subscribe to this channel.